Well, hello. It's Bruce Williams again, and it's Friday, so it's time for Gross Path Challenge number 37. This is going to be a special multiple choice edition coming to us from the 2018 end of the year assessment, which we give our residents here at the Joint Pathology Center. Before we start, I want to thank my friends and colleagues who have provided me such great images over the years, either directly or through online collections. And we'll start with question number one. This is tissue from a koala. And the question is, what is the most likely cause of this lesion? Answer A is chlamydia trachomatis. Answer B is chlamydia pacorum. Answer C is chlamydia abortus. And answer D is our old friend chlamydia cytosai. Take a minute, review the possibilities, and come up with your answer. Okay, time's up. This question comes from a great article on which reviewed chlamydial diseases in animals, which was in VetPath in 2018 by Nicole Burrell and others. The correct answer for this is B, chlamydia pacorum. Chlamydia trachomatis is a genus or species that's primarily seen in people. Chlamydia abortus is seen in sheep. Chlamydia acidosi is seen in a wide variety of species and when it's initially years ago thought to be the cause of this. But most cases of conjunctivitis and reproductive infections in koalas are the result of infection by chlamydia pacorum. Chlamydiosis will also cause conjunctivitis in a number of species, especially guinea pigs, um, and is well known for causing terrible eye lesions. The animals are infected as they come through the birth canal, but luckily this generally, at least in the guinea pig, is a self-limiting disease and then will go away after a couple of weeks of really nasty eye infections. Okay, let's move on to question number two. Question number two is tissue from a dog. And I'm going to ask you, which of the following is true about this condition in dogs? Answer A, the disease is considered to be the result of MHC2 antigen diversity. Answer B, in this condition, skin lesions generally precede ocular lesions. Answer C, is vacuolar change of the basal layer with apoptosis is commonly seen and potential answer four or D is leukotrichia is a common finding in areas of leukoderma. Take a moment and think very carefully. Okay, did you get this one? This one's a little tricky, but it comes to us straight out of Jubb and Kennedy, volume one, page 557. The correct answer is D. Leukotrichia is a common finding in areas of leukoderma. Okay, I probably should back up on this one. We're looking at a dog with significant depigmentation and ulceration of the normally pigmented nostrils and nasal planum. You can see that it is a sled dog, or maybe one of the dogs from the Far East. This particular condition is known as uveodermatologic condition, or as I learned it, the Voigt Harada Koyanagi syndrome, and is the result of sensitization of the body to pigment, especially in the face and in the eyes, and there is always a profound granulomatous or histiocytic response. Okay, so go back to this question. 
Leukotrichia is a common finding in areas of leukoderma. Leukoderma are, is the infiltration of the skin by macrophages sensitive to the presence of the pigment. And in these areas, you will see whitening of the hair or leukotrichia. Let's go back to the other answers. Answer A was the disease is considered to be the result of MHC2 antigen diversity. That is not correct. The disease is considered to be the result of dog leukocyte antigen or DLA genetic diversity. Incorrect answer B was skin lesions generally precede ocular lesions. No, that is the other way around and the eye lesions usually precede the onset of the skin lesions. And answer C was vacuolar change of the basal layer with apoptosis is commonly seen. Neither of those are commonly seen when you see vacuolar change of the basal layer with apoptosis. I would think about one of the other usually lymphocyte mediated immune mediated diseases such as lupus, discoid lupus or cutaneous lupus or possibly some of the pemphigus lesions. Okay, slide number three is a classic picture from a duck. This was taken from Noah's archive, always one of my favorite. The question on this is name another lesion that may be found in this individual. Your choices are A, corneal opacities, B, hemorrhage in the intestinal lymphoid tissue, C, gangleoneuritis of the intestinal plexi, or D, fibrinous epicarditis. Okay, time's up. Did you get the correct answer? The correct answer for this question is B, hemorrhage in the intestinal lymphoid tissue. What we're looking at here is the prolapsed phallus of a duck. And it's a characteristic sign in male ducks that are infected with a natted herpes virus type 1, which goes by many names. Uh, duck plague is one. Duck viral enteritis is another. And so the male ducks often will have these prolapsed penises. If we look at all the other incorrect answers, corneal opacity has been seen in ducks infected with West Nile virus, or excuse me, with HPAI, and that was recently published in Veterinary Pathology, and there's some wonderful pictures. Not West Nile, HPAI. Let me get that straight. Uh, foil number C, ganglioneuritis of the intestinal plexi. Well, that's a disease that's seen with avian borna virus in proventricular dilatation syndrome of cytosines. And you can see it in a couple of other diseases, including uh, West Nile virus and certain types of birds, including cranes. And finally, incorrect answer D, fibrinous epicarditis is seen in a disease of ducks that's caused by Rhymerella natopastifer. It's a classic gram-negative sepsis, which causes fibrin deposition in potential spaces because Rhymerella used to be Pastorella. Pastorella loves to do that, and that condition is known as new duck disease, but it's not seen in adult animals. It's usually seen in ducklings between three to six weeks of age. If you're looking for a confirmation of this question, look in the Avian Disease Manual, pages 42 and 43, where they discuss duck viral enteritis. Slide number four comes to us from a horse. What is the most likely diagnosis? Your choices are A, pancreatic carcinoma, B, mammary carcinoma, C, gastric squamous cell carcinoma, or D, melanoma. Okay, time's up. This one's up at Jeb and Kennedy as well. It's a classic lesion in horses with answer C, gastric squamous cell carcinoma. 
Okay, we're looking at the liver here, intestine, the abdomen is full of hemorrhagic fluid, and the omentum, which we can see here, is covered with small neoplastic nodules. This is fairly classic for gastric squamous cell carcinoma. This animal probably had a severely depleted body score and may have exhibited hypercalcemia. It's one of the neoplasms that causes hypercalcemia in domestic species and characteristically, if left to its own devices, will explant onto cirrhosal surfaces. I would like pancreatic carcinoma, answer A, mammary carcinoma, answer B, for a cat perhaps, or maybe even a dog. Pancreatic carcinoma, a rather metastasized, tends to explant widely, and in cats you can commonly see mammary carcinoma and carcinomatosis. Melanoma in a horse probably wouldn't present like this, and they usually have significant amounts of pigment, and it's not a difficult diagnosis. Well, let's move on. Slide number five is from an ox, and I would like for you to give me the most likely cause of this lesion. Oh, I got to give you the answer. Sorry about that. Your potential answers are A, bovine herpes virus type 1, B, bovine herpes virus type 2, C, bovine herpes virus type 4, and D, bovine herpes virus type 5. Okay, time's up. This is condition which results in ulcerative vulvovaginitis and is known in cattle as infectious vulvovaginitis. Whenever I see ulceration on the genitals of just about any species, you have to consider herpes viruses, especially alpha herpes viruses, because they will do that in humans. They'll do it in non-human primates. They'll do it in horses, equine coital exanthema, and in cattle. It is caused by answer A, bovine herpes virus type 1. That's also the same virus that causes infectious bovine rhinotracheitis, and in bulls, it will cause an infectious or ulcerative balanopostitis as well. Your other choices were bovine herpes virus type 2. That one causes skin disease as well. It causes a number of them, including bovine herpes mammalitis, affecting the teats, and pseudolumpy skin disease, but not this ulcerative lesion of the vulva. Bovine herpes virus type 4 is a redenovirus, which affects the reproductive tract, and it often causes a subclinical endometritis, vulvovaginitis, mastitis, and it may cause abortion retention of fetal membranes, but it's usually subclinical and not what I would consider a, a significant cause of this ulcerative lesion. And finally, bovine herpes virus type 5 is a devastating neurologic disease affecting the brain in cattle in South America and other parts of the world. Okay, I hope you're liking this uh, multiple choice. I've had a number of requests for a multiple choice gross path challenge, which is a little more in concert with the image part of the ACVP exam. So I hope it's translating well for you. It's a little more work, I know, writing these answers down. But let's move on to slide number six. This is tissue from a sheep, and I would like to know which of the following is true. This virus, A, this virus infects squamous but not mucosal epithelium. B, non-ruminants may be infected. C, Vegetative endothelial growth factor is an important virulence factor for this virus. Or D, mortality may exceed 25% in infected herds. 
Okay, time's up. The correct answer is answer C. Vegetative endothelial growth factor is an important virulence factor for this virus. And that's true because this particular growth factor results in epidermal hyperplasia and capillary growth with increased vascular permeability, which allows increased viral replication, access to more target cells, and the formation of crusts. Let's look at the FOIL answers. Answer A was this virus infects squamous but not mucosal epithelium. Absolutely not true. It can infect mucosal epithelium all the way down to the glandular stomach or abomasum in ruminants. FOIL number two is that non-ruminants may be infected. This appears to be a disease that is peculiar to ruminants, especially sheep and goats. And FOIL number four, mortality may exceed 25% in infected herds. No, mortality is generally very low. Now, this is a parapox disease. This, and I should have started out with this, but I'm new to these multiple choice exams, or at least fairly new. Um, should have mentioned, we are looking at crusting and proliferation of the skin of the lips. There may be some internal lesions. This is classic for a disease known as contagious eczema, also known as ORF. And um, it is caused by a parapox. Because it's a parapox, the morphologic diagnosis would probably be proliferative and necrotizing uh, chylitis and nasal dermatitis. Um, it's parapox, but parapox lesions are pretty much just like pox lesions. So the morphologic diagnosis doesn't change very much. And this is contagious eczema in people uh, who can be infected. We're going to have to change B because I said non-ruminants may be infected. I neglected to think about uh, humans, humans get it. It's called ORF. It's a painful lesion. If you said non-ruminants may be infected, give yourself credit. Hey, I'm not perfect. And uh, interestingly, we had this question on test, and nobody raised that. So at least in domestic species, it's primarily uh, ruminants. So remember, VEGF, if you are memorizing pathogenic uh, factors, virulence factors, is the important one for parapox. Oh, and the mortality is very low. Now, when we look at other pox viruses, some like sheep or goat pox, yes, you may exceed 25% infected herds. Those tend to infect the animal systemically, not just concentrating on cutaneous or mucosal lesions. So you'll see it in the lungs. You will see it in the, uh, in the kidney. You'll see proliferation uh, and necrosis of epithelium. Those tend to be fairly immunosuppressive as well. So the traditional pox in sheep and goats may exceed 25%, but not contagious eczema. Okay, we're looking at slide number seven. This is a classic. What a great picture. And this is tissue from an ox. And what is the most likely cause of this lesion? Your four answers are A, Fusobacterium necrophorum, B, Aspergillus fumigatus, C, Listeria monocytogenes, or D, Salmonella typhimurium. Okay, time's up. You can look this one up in Jeb and Kennedy if you want. Very straightforward question. The correct answer is A, Fusobacterium necrophorum. Nothing else looks like this in the liver of ruminants. We have these flat areas of bland necrosis, which are surrounded by hemorrhage. They're multifocal coalescing. Fused bacterium has a very prominent exotoxin. This causes bland necrosis and the hemorrhage and the inflammation. There's no blood supply in here. So everything piles up at the edge of the lesion. So you always get a rim of uh, hemorrhage, but it doesn't protrude from the capsule. It's extremely well delineated from the surrounding tissue. So really, fused bacterium necrophorum is about the only thing that you can come up with here. 
my foils were aspergillus fumigatus, not a big thing in the liver. You might see targetoid lesions in the lung uh, in animals that have had ruminal acidosis with invasion of the uh, uh, of the, the rumen. Usually the lesions are, are restricted to the four stomachs and they will be round. They will be surrounded by hemorrhages, but you don't get a similar liver in the lesion. Uh, horses, you'll see aspergillus calls really nice targetoid lesions in the lung areas of, of thrombosis and hemorrhage is what is at the center of those targetoid lesions. That's usually seen in animals with ulcerative enteritis like salmonella where the normal um, uh, aspergillus, which is just in the gut, gets into the bloodstream and goes to the lungs and starts causing thrombosis. Okay. Uh, C, listeria monocytogenes will certainly cause uh, necrosis in the liver, especially of aborted fetuses. It's bland necrosis. It's not well delineated like this. It's very nice because you put a gram stain and you can easily see the organisms, but you don't get the beautiful delineation that you do with Fusobacterium. And finally, Salmonella typhimurium. You may see that in cattle. It's more of an intestinal lesion. It is not a host adapted, so you don't generally get systemic lesions associated with Salmonella typhimurium in cattle. You may have systemic lesions associated with Salmonella Dublin, which is a host adapted Salmonella. Those are the ones that will cause systemic sepsis. Once again, never these beautiful lesions. If you see something like this, it's Fusobacterium until proven otherwise. Slide number eight comes to us from Dr. Oscar Quesada from the University of Las Palmas de Gran Canaria. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, I put his picture in upside down so the ruler would read uh, better. And this is tissue from a dog. Uh, another great question straight out of Jovan Kennedy. And what is the most likely diagnosis? Potential answer A is Mycobacterium avium infection. Potential, potential answer B is lymphangiectasia. Potential answer C is boxer colitis. And potential answer D is Lawsonia intracellulare infection. Take a moment, review your options, come up with an answer, and let's discuss. Okay, time's up. What we're seeing in a dog, and we're seeing these linear areas in which all of the villi are distended and they're white. And that is because the lymphatics within them or the lacteals are full of fat rich chyle. If we flip this over, probably we would see that the lymphatics on the outside are also distended. We might see uh, inflammation in the mesenteric node. And this is a condition known as lymphangiectasia. And that was potential answer B. And some of you are going to look at me and they're going to say, well, why isn't the whole thing uh, uh, these dilated lacteals? Why do I have these three lines? That throws me off. Well, remember that these animals, um, they often have severe diarrhea. And they will have sort of a clenching down of the muscle of the intestine. Um, to try and grip something to go through. And when you do that, the areas that are severely contracted, um, they will sort of push all this chyle out and you get the areas here, which are sort of bulging into the lumen. So this is classic enough. Um, the other thing that, that makes this picture a little more difficult to interpret, but certainly not too difficult, um, is uh, the fact that the really nice pictures of this are taken underwater. This one was taken probably flat on a light box. If you put it underwater, all of the villi sort of, they float up and you can really see the lesion very nicely. I think this is a great one that was not taken underwater. Certainly one you should be able to get to lymphangiectasia from. Let's look at our foil answers. Mycobacterium avium infection. It has been seen in dogs. Um, certainly it's a mycobacterium is anywhere we, uh, we are when we take a a sip of a cup of coffee, uh, we're getting mycobacterium avium. If we touch the desktop, we get mycobacterium avium. It's all over the place. But you have to be immunosuppressed. 
to suffer from the disease. And the disease is very similar in people, non-human primates, pigs, anyone who has it. And that's a diffuse granulomatous uh, enteritis. You will have a thickening of the loop of gut, which we really don't see here. Uh, number C is boxer colitis. Same thing. Those are uh, histiocytes which are cram packed with mycobacteria and that will cause a diffuse thickening of the gut not a, uh, a an increased uh, profile of the villus itself they they expand the mucosa the villi in both of those conditions would be blunted um, or shortened or even lost and finally, Lawsonia intracellular infection. I'm not familiar with that in dogs. Um, in horses, it can cause a lesion that will grossly resemble something like mycobacteriosis, a thickening of the gut. It also results in hypoproteinemia in infected uh, horses, which are usually foals. And then in pigs, we know that it causes a number of lesions, including necrotizing and hemorrhagic lesions of the ileum. Not familiar with the uh, with infection in, of dogs with Lawsonia. Okay, slide number nine is tissue from a horse. Which of the following has been associated with this parasite? Potential answer A is perforation and peritonitis. Potential answer B is cecal intussusception or cecal inversion. Potential answer C is intestinal adenocarcinoma. Potential answer D is nothing. It has no associated pathology. Okay, if you want to check this one, you can go to the volume 2, page 222 of Jubb and Kennedy, but uh, this is one that uh, uh, you hear a lot. You hear a lot. Uh, this is tissue from a horse. We are looking at the ileocecal junction. We have these very characteristic cestodes, uh, which are lightly embedded in the mucosa. There is obviously some pathology here, so that makes number D, no associated pathology, sort of moot. And this, the name of this particular parasite, this cestode common in horses, is Paranoplacephala perfoliata. There is another one, a related cestode called Paranoplacephala mammalata, which lives in the small intestine. But these are sort of stubby parasites that generally are present at the ileocecal junction. And they have been for many years, and in many textbooks, uh, reported to be a potential cause of cecal inversion. I'm not a big fan of that. I don't think they do much. I think they get blamed for a lot, sort of like Giardia gets blamed for a lot of uh, diarrhea. It probably doesn't cause, but um, they don't cause perforation peritonitis. There are parasites uh, that will do that at this particular area, especially one in, in primates called Prostenorchis elegans. It's an acanthocephalus. It's a thorny-headed worm, and those are much more likely to cause perforation. They just don't know when to stop burrowing. Um, uh, and then finally, uh, foil number C, intestinal adenocarcinoma. No, there's no reports of this particular parasite causing intestinal adenocarcinoma in the horse. Okay. Slide number 10, and the last one comes to me from my good friend, Crystal LaPearl, when she was working at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Took great images of the mouse and this is tissue from a mouse can you give me the diagnosis your potential answers are a epicardial mineralization b polyarteritis nodosa c lymphoma or d atherosclerosis okay time's up this is straight out of Percy and Barthold, page 93. Um, but the correct answer for this in a very common lesion in a number of strains of mice, included, including uh, uh, C3Hs 
and DBAs and valve C's is epicardial mineralization. Usually doesn't cause much of a problem. Sometimes you will see it most often in the right in, in the right ventricle, but generally not much of a problem. Uh, we see it a lot in the CD3s that we use here uh, uh, at the Joint Pathology Center. And it's very important to know what you to expect in whatever mouth strain you're looking at. So you're not surprised you don't make more of it than it is. And this is a very common non-clinical finding in certain in-brain strains of mice. Hey, how about your foils? B was polyarteritis nodosa, not big in mice. It's a rat thing. Certain strains of rats, uh, Sprague Dolly, and there is a hypertensive strain of rat that you get. So, nah, that's not a good one. A lymphoma. I think that you will see lymphoma in old mice of a lot of different strains, um, but it doesn't cause this crusting lesion. You would see large white masses if you see it in the heart. Uh, it's very commonly seen. When I see big spleen and a big liver uh, in any rodent, I'm thinking lymphoma to start with, but not usually so much in the heart. And then atherosclerosis uh, doesn't really conform to the vessels at all. Atherosclerosis is not very common in mice except for uh, genetically engineered mutants. Um, if I was, if you saw a heart with the vessels outlined with big yellow plaques, it'd probably be a dog, and the dog would suffer from a condition, uh, either thyroiditis or, or diabetes mellitus. So this is epicardial mineralization, really common incidental finding in some strains of mice. Okay, well that brings us to the end of this gross path challenge. It runs a little bit longer. It looks like these multiple choice tests run a little longer than my traditional short answers. If you like this one, send me some email, let me know, and I will make some more. Hey, have a great weekend.